So uh, hopefully he will. In any case, we've got to get started. And so I'd like to begin with um, uh, Mr. Gutierrez. Well, in fact, it's What's that? Ordonez. Ordonez. Uh, they, write, they wrote that. I see. Bad there. Oh, that's Ordonez. incorrect. Ordonez. Yeah, Sergio Ordonez. I see. Um, and um, he's going to speak to us uh, this morning about Mexico and um, the revolution in Mexico. Um, and he's going to look at it from the framework of uh, Gramsci's idea of passive revolution. Okay. Yeah. And uh, well, and uh, I uh, I want to propose some guidelines of this concept. I mean, uh, passive revolution for understanding uh, and acting on the present. So. Uh, well, my, the, the order of my presentation would be, first I want to introduce the concept of passive revolution, another Gramscian, uh, Gramscian related concept. Secondly, uh, I want to uh, make uh, some points about Mexican revolution as a passive revolution. And th third, uh, I want to propose some guidelines for understanding and acting on the present based on the concept of passive revolution. Uh, well, I think that the great uh, challenge that Gramsci put uh, to Marxism was uh, explaining how, how in a uh, in a historical crisis of capitalism, uh, the outcome would not be social revolution, as stated by Marx, but instead of that, a process of capitalism renovation. No. That was, that, that is the great problem, of the great challenge that Gramsci posed to Marxism in the thirds. To explain that without a, within the framework, the theoretical framework of, of Marxism, he introduced some methodology, methodological and uh, mediation concepts into, into uh, uh, dimensions. First, uh, Concepts mediating a double dimension of, of historicity of capitalism. That is, uh, understand uh, the historicity of capitalism as a model production, that was uh, Marx's uh, contribution, but uh, also to understand the, the, the historicity of capitalism as a succession, succession of uh, develop of uh, uh, capitalistic development phases, of phases of development of capitalism. And uh, the other dimension for this uh, mediation concept was uh, between mediating between the structure or economical structure, so social subjects or uh, groups or uh, social classes and groups, and their, their possibilities of engaging into action. So uh, mediating this, this relation between structure and social subject and their possibilities of engaging into action. So uh, to explain uh, why in a, in a historical crisis uh, the outcome is, uh, would be a process of capitalis uh, capitalism renovation, he introduces a central concept of hegemony. A hegemony as mediating uh, class struggle, class struggle uh, as, a, as an expression of, uh, of the contradiction between productive forces and social, social relations which uh, in uh, Marxist 
frame explains uh, the historical change. So uh, the, the great contribution was to introduce hegemony as mediating social struggle and the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of uh, then the possibility of mediating, mediating social struggle uh, within a, a certain period of time. Uh, passive revolution is then a uh, concept der derived from hegemony and it implies uh, that only dominant classes and groups develop all the possibilities of action uh, in order to, to avoid being uh, overtaken historically. And they do that by assuming as they own alien and contrary aims and interests interest, incorporate incorp and incorporating them in their own historical project. So uh, that's the centrality of the concept of passive revolution. Um, and other concepts derived from hegemony are historical, well, historical block, which is a most, more uh, known concept, system of hegemony of the states, are inter and intellectuals. Well, uh, well, with that uh, frame, we want. Well, I want to uh, make uh, a lecture of Mexican Revolution, explaining it as a passive revolution. Uh, well, for. Uh, Commonly, on, on, we understand uh, the Mexican Revolution as a long period of Mexican history, which goes from 1910 to 1940. In this uh, long uh, uh, period, we can distinguish three uh, revolutionary processes. First of all, a liberal revolution, which uh, has three great moments. The first one is uh, Madero's, uh, Madero and Carranza's <coughs> revolution, which uh, were looking for democratizing uh, Porfiria liberal state. The second one is Obregón's uh, revolution. The second moment is Re Obregón's, Re Obregón's uh, contribution, which uh, who was looking for um, who, who uh, promoted a, part, a partial passive revolution uh, incorporating uh, aims and interests of, uh, of the working class in order to oppose the peasant revolution, which is the, third, the second revolutionary process. And the third moment of uh, the liberal revolution is uh, the Calles moment, uh, whose contribution was to uh, unify the political intellectuals or the new political class in a new party uh, named uh, Partido Nacional Revolucionario, which was the antecedent of the actual pre uh, Partido Revolucionario Institucional. Uh, the second uh, revolutionary process was uh, the peasant revolution of, uh, well, represented by Villa, which uh, was looking for land restitution and the formation of peasant small properties. And the, the other uh, pers uh, personage of uh, the peasant revolution was Zapata, which was, uh, who was also looking for land restitution and the instauration of collective ejido as a uh, peasant form of production uh, and corresponding to, to that the instauration of peasant communities as a form of peasant governance, peasant social governance. 
the third uh, revolutionary process was that of Cardinals, which, uh, which uh, consists of a passive revolution. Uh, well, this, this passive revolution uh, put uh, import substitution industrialization at the center of the um, national historical project, uh, at the national, uh, yes, at the national historical project, as a project of, of, of a nation. And in order to do that, uh, it was necessary to promote a process of substitution of industrial bourgeoisie by the state. In order to oppose, to, to confront the opposition of, of the uh, hegemo hegemonic agro-mining exporting bourgeoisie, and which was, uh, whose alliance with la landowners was uh, eliminated or disrupted by the Mexican, by the peasant revolution, and because uh, uh, the, the necessity of confronting the opposition of the great powers and foreign capital, uh, particularly uh, US uh, foreign capital. To the, in order to do that, uh, he pushed <coughs> forward subaltern and uh, classes, classes and groups aims. Uh, at, and that result in a concerning working classes, uh, the projection of the incorporation of collective bargaining, bargaining industrial union, uh, working condition regulation, and uh, labor force social reproduction in a new in a new uh, national uh, in, a, in a new historical. Uh, national project. Uh, and concerning peasants, uh, it, it promoted uh, the collective ejido providing aliments uh, for the workers of the new industry uh, as a form of production, as, as a standard form of production, uh, peasant form of production. Uh, and and he promoted also the participation of peasants in agrarian reform regulation and in the fixing of aliment prices. So uh, that that uh, those mainly those elements um, characterize the uh, Cardenist social revolution. Uh, at that time. Well, uh, and going, coming into the present, um, well, import substitution crisis at the, at the, at the end of the 70s uh, resulted on the, on the emergence of neo neoliberalism in Mexico as a part of development to knowledge capitalism as a new phase of development. Uh, uh, of the new capitalistic phase of the world, which now is in crisis. Uh, then I will argue here how to understand uh, and to how and how uh, using this concept of passive revolution we can uh, view. Uh, a progressive outcome of this neo neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism consists of the integration, the articulation on, of a new technological productive place, uh, of, or in the case of Mexico, we must talk about elements of a new technological productive base with a recomposed 
corporatist historical bloc, which emerged from uh, precisely from the Mexican Revolution. No. This recomposition of the corporatist historical bloc uh, consist, consisted of a, a new alliance between the, hegemon the hegemonic classes uh, which uh, I, uh, I mean the agro-mining uh, agro exportator uh, uh, bourgeoisie in alliance with the transnational financial and industrial groups, a new alliance with interna international institutions promoting neoliberalism and the global political networks. No. Uh, this new alliance uh, included two uh, foreign transnational uh, financial capital and industrial capital. Um, and it was incorporated to, do, to this new alliance some groups of intellectuals, some groups of uh, middle classes uh, based on trade liberalization and the, uh, the cheap uh, price of, import, of, import, of imports which gave, gave uh, middle classes a new access to new products. Uh, and this recomposition of, 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 of the corporatist historical bloc uh, included a uh, rupture of the uh, historical compromises uh, established with import substitution in neutral bourgeoisie uh, with other groups of middle classes, with workers, peasants, <coughs> and urban popular groups, um, which now uh, resolve their contradictions or the conflicts in the, in, in the framework of a new parliamentarism uh, which uh, substitute uh, the pre uh, in the resolution of, of those conflicts. So uh, I, I propose that in order to, uh, to enable a progressive outcome of this crisis, uh, a new passive revolution would be necessary. Uh, and this passive revolution must uh, include a whole refoundation of the historical block in terms of a new social learning and innovation. Um, and this whole refoundation of the historical block must uh, include or, uh, or re reconstruct <coughs> these uh, broken historical compromises in terms of a social, cognitive, and productive inclusion, uh, which uh, taking the form of a social knowledge economy as a form of, as a new cogn cognitive and productive inclusion of, of subaltern groups. And it, it must include to uh, the uh, reconstruction of, uh, of the compromise uh, for, uh, of the compromise with uh, import substitution industrial bourgeoisie uh, by promoting promoting it, the, the, insert, the, the insertion of this uh, industrial bourgeoisie in, into the global uh, productive network and the reconstruction of uh, value chains in a national regional uh, scale and uh, finally it, it must include uh, the subsumption of the relation of the hegemonic classes 
uh, with the international institutions yes, okay. to the uh, terms yes, yes. of this social uh, knowledge economy. Uh, that could uh, that could uh, result in a progressive outcome to the actual neoliberal crisis. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, my name is Hong Seo Ryu uh, from London, but my homeland is South Korea. Uh, I study economics, but it isn't. So, but I wanted to make any kind of contribution to conference about you know revolutionary movement in South Korea. Um, the title, I guess, it could make you confused the importance of democracy and completion of democracy in South Korea. There are two democracies here. Mm, I will explain later you know, in, in the end of the presentation. The subtitle is A Civil War Between Ruling Classes and Mobilization of Public in the Mass Demonstra Demonstration Against the Previous President. Um, uh, let me explain just shortly political turbulence recently, uh, last, from the last October to May this year, the total number of particip participants of a demonstration for the impeachment of a president was, uh, you might know, the, <laughs> the for the three numbers. Uh, the first one is the vote of the demonstration. It has a so wrong name anyway. It was done by, you know, the people, mm, 16 million yeah. for that time, you know, just to seven, actually in you know, six months. You know. um, police, government, yeah, they do their job. And the result, yeah, the president was impeached in March. And uh, Jae Yong Di, the facto owner of Samsung was arrested with bribery. And Moon Jae-in, Moon Jae-moon, the new president, was elected. Uh, shortly, I will explain the basic information on democracy of South Korea, and then what, why, then implications. Um, here's the democratization, demo, democratization of South Korea. Thing. First line is just the you know, basic information. Uh, U.S. military government you know, in make, it establishes sort of, you know, sort of you know, democratic legal system in South Korea. And then he, Seung Nan Lee, was you know, the previous the independence fighter, right? so pro-America. Um, he was a dictator, but this government collapsed the, in with the 419 revolution. And then, A7, A7, there was a great struggle, we, we call, we call great struggle by workers. And before the time, by direct, indirect election for President Boston. And then, it should be to direct election. And, um, yeah, this, candlelight revolution. Mm, yes, it's it called, normally it's called the revolution, the, the last one. The last one, revolution by politicians. But they don't say what kind of revolution it is. Um, they say just, you know, impeaching. Impeaching the government or the president is revolution, but, you know. Um, um, let me say another information. In 1960, it's during the recession, so severe. The dependent, the dependence of economy of South Korea was so strong on the U.S. And then here, this time, so glorious, proper time. And now recession. So. It's impossible, actually. You know, we know, we know, 
the linkage between economic situation, you know, business cycle, and political you know, movement or situation. Uh, in case, in the case of you know, democratization in South Korea, it isn't. It isn't to apply, applied to use the, those kind of abstract theory directly. But I will, I will use that theory. Yeah. Mm. South Korea discount in you know, business area. One is you know, arbitrary decision making by the owner, so uh, owner of uh, biggest capitalist in South Korea. They called Chebol. You know. And another one is North Korea. We, you know, Korean people, South Korean people, don't worry. We don't worry about war, but foreign people, oh, no. They missiles, oh, no. And they're telling them, no, are you okay, like this. So the, the foreign people, foreign people, especially business area, they worry, they worry these kind of things. And as I said, Jebel, large capitalist, 84% um, of GDP, by 10 biggest Japan, Japan's in 2015. Um, over generations, normally now a third generation. There's one family governing the business of Japan. And 5% 5 5 employment in 2014. But it is about employment. The, the influence or the influence of Japan is so strong in case it, Samsung is most the biggest one, it's the biggest one, 60% uh, corporate tax and 60% market capitalization in yeah, the same year, 2014. Uh, political situation, after the crisis 1997, uh, new liberalism was introduced by government very strongly, of, of course. The IMF program was imposed yeah, forcibly. And then Jebel, yeah, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed it. Yeah, everything go well. And yeah, they called two government called democratic government. Yes, why not? Compared to the previous governments, yes, it's more democratic. And first shift of power. And yeah, the third point, you know, this one. It legalizes the economic system, but I guess most important thing is the establishment of this commission. You might know. Even the time, workers' movement was so militant. But come, we are on crisis, our nation. Come here, talk about the future of our nation. So make them, make them confine themselves within legal system. After that time, the you know, normal. No more work, working movement, you know, parties for the day worry about that. Is it legal or illegal? But people at the time, everything was illegal. So, what's the problem? Just well. But here, it makes more legalized and more, more, how can I say, a legal exploitation system was established in these democratic governments. And yeah, nowadays, North Korea is so hot issue. So I post that time sunshine, sunshine policies was done. Mm, and the recent nine years, yeah, recovery of author, authoritative <coughs> governments, and but successive neoliberalism, and the breakdown of commission. Because they are so hostile and strong, you don't need any kind of discussion with you. Neighbor? No, nah, no. Nah. You are just uh, sorry, pigs or dogs. Uh, and shrinking the power of the workers' movement, hostile policy against North Korea. Uh, Straightforward. Why people? Why people against the government? Yeah, it's recession. It shows unemployment rate. Of course, it it was made by government, so you know, normally educated people in South Korea don't believe this. Probably higher than at least 50 or 40, for at least percent. 
would be higher than this. Anyway, you can see, sorry, you can see in here, yeah, was also pro prosperous time, but in short busy cycle. And from, ah, here, sorry, here, here is prosperous time and going up, mm, never recovered. Yeah. So government falsified this information so far. Yeah. So probably, which my guess, probably here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of thing. So for people, for people, crisis hasn't been recovered. And another one, G corruption. Yes. You can see tremendous polarization in South Korea. Of course, there are very clever strategy, very clever strategy for government to make, to construct social welfare system for the, you know, the lowest level of people in society, to prevent any danger in the future. So there are two systems. Polarization and supporting the low level of people. Um, the igni agitation? Igniting or yes, ignition, yes, yes. ignition of the revolution. Ignition, sorry. Uh, ignition of revolution. Social background. Yeah, there was so, yeah, so sorry for accident. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a there was a ferry I think that yes. collapsed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sank and two hundred and sixty one high school student died. Actually killed. Um a small farmer, yeah, Nam Gipe was also killed during the in the demonstration of this government by water cannon. And yes, it's background. It was 18, you know, 2015, 2014, and 2016. Each, <coughs> uh, sorry, each, uh, sorry, I forgot to read. Each, uh, 2016, April. The demonstration started in October. Uh, bribery, yes, like this. Uh, 50, 51 million US dollar. But it was calculated by the you know, prosecutor. So it, it isn't, it, it, it doesn't show the actual amount of bribery. But at least this amount was, you know, was covered, was co uncovered. So. And the ridiculous thing is secret, unofficial line, yeah, so she didn't mm -hmm. And she was so old, probably best friends of the president, she appointed some old cabinet members and she used the top secret government document. Uh, for example, you know, the, the preferred document to say, to say uh, US president is top secret. The address, the prepared address was was yeah was read by her like this and she she used actually she used those kind of degree to make money mm. it's another story but trivial and and it it is the 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 daughter of Che she entered a very famous college without any academic score <laughs> and she didn't she didn't she didn't come to the classes, but she got good scores. <laughs> so it makes people, it makes people, ah, oh, no, my children, my son and daughter study so hard to enter these good universities. But what is? It makes people crazy. <laughs> yeah, sometimes those kind of, you know, things which can be, which, which, which people can feel with their skin, it's influential. Uh, but how, how, how the secret 
was exposed to by the biggest media. Yeah, first one, Chosun Yilbo, yeah, having you know far right wing position, and it is, it is traditional, traditional supporter of the right wing, you know, in dictatorship or even now, but they revealed the corruption and you know the unofficial line. <clears throat> and JTBC, the broadcasting system, but it owned by Samsung. So we can know, yeah, it's inner, inner struggle, but sorry, inner struggle within ruling classes. Uh, people, in the demonstration, people, yes, impeachment, corruption, good, yeah. But it doesn't. It doesn't broaden, didn't broaden to revolutionary change in society, unfortunately, because it was done within the legal system. And was so powerful, so powerful, then candidate of next president, they promised to change you know, several system in the future. I will say it later. Um, why? Why capitalist? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Break down the legal system doesn't help. Please for the severe labor situation. I said South Korea suffered. The people, common people, have suffered the recession. So impossible, you know. The pressure, the the pressed gas, it must be explode, explode, sorry, explode. But this this explosion could be dangerous. Yeah. And yeah, shut down, shut down the joint com joint Korean Kaesong industrial complex, which you know, cooperative cooperative business between North and South Korea in area of North Korea. Uh, in February. 2016, government shut suddenly, without any discussion, without any exposure of information in advance. Mm -hmm. Shut down. So it shows, and, and another one, yes, the bribery, very crude. Call them, call them here, and secretly say, give me money, I will give you something. Very crude. You know, there are more elegant forms of bribery in capitalism. But <laughs> uh, so it means that she didn't, she didn't obey, she didn't obey in a capitalist legal system. Yeah. Two facts, two facts it shows. Of course, the first one is of course. But actually, actually the capitalist doesn't need it. They don't, they, they don't know legal system. Yeah. It depends on the situation, what project or what strategy is more helpful to exploit, it. that's all. Anyway. You might imagine, you might imagine the situation of Jebel with the shift of their you know, political situation in South Korea. Tactics of bourgeois. Uh, separation between corruption and its policy. At the first time, the mass media, you know, the powerful mass media, they said, yeah, government did, so bad, poor. But you know, people started to criticize about government and it, it broadened, broadened that. So, as I said, the de facto owner of Samsung was arrested. You know, it was a failure of a capitalist. So they started to separate the bribery of the government, or the corruption of government, or unofficial sort of you know, the things, and its neoliberal policies. So he said, "Yeah." Our, our nation, our nation must support, must continue neoliberal, neoliberal, neoliberal politics, policies. <laughs> and very ridiculous of that. Very <laughs> funny, yeah. Jebel, they contested their own crime. Ah, oh, I gave money. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, give my flesh, I will take your bone. It's a very simple strategy. Uh, legalization of exploitation, but criminalization 
of any militant activities of the workers' movement. And why just spread the criticism of aristocracy trade union? Why just spreading? And changing of concept, that's very, very important in terms of ideological area, in terms of critic, you know, blind critic from Jongo, meaning, literally meaning North Korea followers, to Jokpe uh, Chongsen, meaning creating deep rooted evil. But the evil is a pre capital relationship. Relations of all, you know, any society has a mixture of pre-capitalist relationship and capitalist relationship. So rivalry, yeah, in South Korea, normally the cost of rival was calculated as you know constant, constant cost of business. You know, business man, they know that it's normal. What problem? Yeah, this this land of people, you know, office, office, you know, public office, yeah, give this money. These people, yeah, give them money. Ah, this, yes, give this money, like this. There is a length and money of life. Doesn't matter. But they change the concept of this. And the second, the clever conversion of North Korea from national enemy to a future colony. It's a mind of capitalism to use, to exploit, the workers of North Korea and exploit, exploit the minor mineral, sorry, mineral resources as well. Yeah, they are abundant, abundant, you know, abundant mine, mineral resources. Nowadays, China is number one investor on those mining industry in North Korea. So, you know, some media is living is easy information. How could I know China is best number one investor? They reveal this kind of you know before before China you know, grasp all the resources we have to invest. Yeah. Uh, immediate result. Uh, yeah. People's power absorbed was absorbed to by election. Yeah. And current government, yeah, yeah, gesture, deal gesture. To reform Jebel, but have, haven't done nothing, haven't done practically anything. And none of the new dialectic democratic system yeah, was introduced. We might know, you know head of a police or head of a judge can be elected by the people, but the agent, he used, he used his you know, power supported by the legal and no, supported by political and social system supporting the authoritative, you know, hierarchical power relationship or power system. He used this power because it's a kind of blank of power. The previous author authoritative you know, group, yeah, they shrank, yeah, were prison, and the capitalist, they shrank because they confessed. They confessed their crimes. So it's a blank of power. But their you know, power system remained. So he used the system to legalize all system of South Korea. And this, he reestablished the commission. It's a new version, new version of you know, nationalization of people's mind. Mm, implication of the candlelight revolution. Um, yes. Five minutes. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the last slide. Thank you. Um, <coughs> completion of Brazil's revolution to go up another exporting system based in more more legal systems such as developed countries. At least within South Korea. And Germany is changing for more official position of the legal system. You know, I said there is a you know, Korean discount, you know, arbitrary decision making by you know, persons of family in Chebel. But they could, they, they, yeah, they show some signals, signals make more, you know, the predictable, predictable system in the market. 
Um, Kiefer, yeah, it's only one hope nowadays, I think. Uh, they have their own mouth unmuzzled from jungle. In the past, if I say anything, anything against government, I could, I know, I must be blamed or criticized, sometimes accused as a spy or jungle. Yeah. My bank account can be inspected by government without any notice. So, but now, they have their own mouth to say. And second, it's success is experience. Anyway, anyway, what changed, regardless of what changed, they experienced this success. They mobilized, of course, I said mobilized, they mobilized it. But, first time, first time, they mobilized themselves in the center of demonstration. So they have confidence, confidence of political power of their own. So situation, yeah, good and bad, good and bad. Yeah, more legalized, more modulated workers' movement, but there are general increase of political level of people having strong confidence. And Jebel also, it means that Jebel, Jebel must be obey legal system as well. So that's why I said it, 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 it changing, it's changing very similar to that of a um, developed country. Uh, the last, uh, the slide is the end, it's the last. I want to say, I want to say about business cycle, you know, Jebel, mm. Jebel developed it so fast. Yeah. All resources was focused to develop them by dictatorships. So fast, so successful, and of course, with so exploitable condition on workers. And they developed it. And they need something more or something new to develop further. To develop further. But what time? When? When is good time? Good time to overcome what to throw out the old closing, you know, unfixed already. That's your session in South Korea. You know? People became angry. You know, Young people, young, nowadays young people call South Korea hell. Hell. Just to say it's hell. Sure. Of course, hell Joseon. Joseon is in the previous dynasty in Korean peninsula. Hell Joseon. This anger, this anger, people, people, this anger is focused or attacked on capitalism. They want. They want to make a shift to this power, oh, oh, yeah, power anger to criticize government. And additionally, there's bonus to change political system for their own profits. Thank you. Well, uh, we've looked at um, Mexico and um, South Korea, which we could say, uh, to put it uh, mildly, are imperfect democracies. Um, and um, I would not, uh, and faced with, um, uh, in both countries, uh, highly oligarchical systems and very na narrowly concentrated power in both of those countries. And um, democratic forces are, it's very difficult uh, for them. Although I would say in the case of Korea, South Korea, I don't think uh, um, it, it has been sufficiently underlined that this, uh, there was a watershed in 1945 in Korea when, um, when it was a unified entity 
and there was a very, very deep popular revolution in Korea which was uh, frustrated. And I think that what we see, the, the democratic instincts of the South Korean people are uh, that this wave after wave of democracy is rooted in a certain memory of social memory of the, uh, yes, those, yeah. uh, that uh, period in 1945. Uh, but um, um, I said in perfect democracy, but I think uh, we can't say that it's simply a matter of um, um, the global south, the third world countries, because we see uh, now that uh, in Europe, and especially in the United States, uh, the whole question of uh, so-called political democracy has come into question. And um, uh, um, the monthly review, which is a very, uh, on the left, a very important publication, openly says that the United States has uh, moved, has become a fascist country. So, uh, carrying on with this theme, we, we, we have the good fortune, actually, a change in program that um, Andrew Jones of York University is, it, right? is going to talk to us about the neo-fascist revolution in the early 20th century. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to say, I, when I originally pitched this paper, I thought, this is a neo-fascist revolution. My research was mostly focusing on the, myth the use of mythology by the Nazi party and their understanding of ideology. I have done some changes in my research, as any doctoral student does, and I've switched to mostly focus on what I describe as the alt-right, and specifically the alt-right as a revolutionary movement in the mostly in the early 21st century. So I've got three questions to address in this presentation. The first is, what is the alt-right? Obviously, we have a general idea of what the alt-right is, but the issue is that it, the term is used incredibly sloppily. The next is, why is it a revolution? You can broadly say, why is it a counter-revolution? But, at the same, but what I think is really important to address is how this is a departure and a break from the existing systems of conservative and right-wing thought. Particularly the fact that I don't believe that this is simply fascism 2.0, but rather a different ideological system. The third is, what does it gain from critical theory? So for this point, it's going into most of the concepts that we find in thinkers like Deleuze, Derrida, Leotard, Baudrillard, and the like, are definitely taken up by well, many of these right-wing thinkers. So, first of all, I, bring, I think about the alt-right as three different groups. First, we have the most obvious one, which are the activists. These activists, you can think about them as those people who voted for Donald Trump, and to various extents, those people who go on right-wing marches, those people who mobilize figures, in the public, and those people who have rabble-roused to various extent. There's also the thinkers. So the thinkers are largely the uh, public intellectuals who have been writing on these ideas, mostly posting them online, and having other forms of kind of fringe publications. This group is widely under-researched in academics right now. And then there's a the third group, the financiers, and those who are gaining from the system we all know major capitalist figures. Uh, Andrew Breitbart was one. We have the Mercers. We have the Koch brothers. Donald Trump is an example. These are all figures that are gaining extensively from this movement. We also know that the alt-right is largely focused on what it opposes. So it opposes globalization. It uses the term globalist as a slanderous term. It is fundamentally anti-liberal. It's also anti-feminist, and if you look at the origins of the movement in the past 15, 20 years, uh, one of the main sources has been the anti-feminist communities online that have become the most toxic and vile and started off as a dress rehearsal for the events in 2016. I'm going to be focusing largely on the Anglo-American presence because I'm an English language speaker, I've lived in the UK, Canada, and the US. These are the places that I feel comfortable talking about. Their presence has been found in Europe, 
and has been in Europe for a longer period of time, and which is not normally known as the alt-right, but is still largely connected. They read the same material, interact with each other. So breaking it down, these are the four main reasons why I think the alt-right appeared. First of all, if you look at contemporary Anglophone uh, society, you will notice that the culture, the quote-unquote culture wars have been won by progressives and liberals. Not completely successful, but if you look at mainstream media, you're seeing increased um, presentation of critical ideas. If you think about any movie that receives widespread acclaim, these are films that have been arguing for a liberal or progressive politics. The alt-right and those members on the fringe have been noticing that their politics isn't being represented in the media, so they, and the same thing with universities. Even though they may dominate society, white working class men entering universities don't find uh, universities to be a safe space for their point of views and for their hatred. So they start engaging in violent politics on university campuses. Next, obvious one for most people at this conference would be economic alienation and specifically a rise of financial capitalism. If you look at figures such as Steve Bannon, they'll publicly state that it was the 2008 financial crisis that made them uh, feel that they were alienated from the economic system, even though they were very wealthy. They are arguing during this period of time that the financial system was effectively uh, used by the United States government to prop up businesses and wasn't allowing capitalism to flourish as it would be. This is where we see some of the Tea Party movement and this alienation. We see it uh, largely within white, white working class that are seeing their standards of living dropping. And we also see this within elements of the capitalist class who clearly benefit from deregulation and buying up fail failing companies. The next perceived influx of minorities within Western societies. This hatred is very pronounced in Europe. It's also pronounced in the United States against uh, Latin American migrant workers and refugees. We're seeing that this is a common, common source of violence and a common rallying cry. And the fourth, perhaps the most unique of these, is uh, the use of accelerationist philosophy and the focus on the uh, technophilic uh, society. This is where we see figures like Nick Land uh, as a right-wing accelerationist, and figures like Peter Thiel uh, supporting a introduction of new technological solutions to the world. These are people who acknowledge that climate change is real, but are going to look at it and say, solution is more technology. Solution is going to be more technology. Solution is going to be more technology. So I think there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the alt-right as a movement. Hillary Clinton last year uh, described them as a basket of deplorables, painted the alt-right in one broad brush as white nationalists and members of the KKK and the like. Many mem members of the alt-right are white nationalists. And that's something that no one will disagree with, but there is more to the movement than that group. What that does is it alienates those people who are unsure in electoral politics for which side they're going to support. We understand that the all right movement is fundamentally against liberal politics and liberal globalization. This has meant that many elements of the mainstream media, especially in the United States, have created a false equivalency of a horseshoe theory of suggesting that those members of the socialist left are in fact members of the alt-right who will support Donald Trump rather than support a liberal. Despite the fact that empirical data shows that that is not true, and in fact, the example for the 2008 primary say that more Hillary Clinton supporters voted for John McCain as a percentage than Bernie Sanders supporters voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. Another important note that makes this different than, say, the fascist movement in the uh, early 20th century is that in the, the fascist movement had many famous university-educated professors 
arguing for it and supporting it. We all know of Heidegger, we know about Gentili and the like, they were, and Schmidt. They're all prominent university figures supporting fascist movements. In contrast, it, you can't find far-right uh, intellectuals in the same university spaces having the same clout. They've been largely isolated from those spaces and have been put onto the, the fringe. You can find them online, you can find their blogs, you can find them in, having independent publications, but you don't find them in the same university spaces. Additionally, I would argue for my research that the alt-right is coming out of fascism and specifically more of an Italian fascism than a Nazi fascism. They're not using the same rhetoric of Nazism. They may use some imagery for it, but the imagery isn't necessarily used because it's fascist imagery. It's used because it's affectively shocking and because it is an easy thing for someone who doesn't know anything else about politics to see a swastika and start making connections. Not necessarily that intellectually or even, uh, mobil even on the level of mobilization, that they support uh, the Nazi policies. In fact, I would argue that they're more following policies of post-war Italian fascism and also the contemporary far-right discourse coming out of France. You're more likely to see them referencing someone like Julius Evola rather than uh, Adolf Hitler in their discourse. The other big thing is that they don't use mainstream media, that the same mainstream media that we share. As many of us know, social media has created echo cham echoing chambers in which our discourse is limited to those people who we agree with. Which means that we all know that when we post on Facebook, we're most likely to see other fellow leftists commenting on posts and that's the views that we're seeing. The same thing happens with the far right in which fake news and the like push forward a post-truth politics. So these are what I would say are the objectives of the alt-right and the far-right. The first one is they're trying to break down traditional left-right barriers in order to provide legitimacy. They're trying to argue that they're the party of the working class, despite, as we all know, they aren't the party of the working class. They, uh, they don't gain their support from those people who are impoverished. Rather, I'd argue that the alt-right gains its support from those people who will likely suffer the most from technological change due to increased neoliberalization and increased automation. It fundamentally wants the destruction of what it views as cultural capital and elites. It views the entire university structure and the structure of mainstream news, mainstream media, as a way of policing the thoughts and cultures of society is also in support of a segregationist and isolationist policy. It views the idea that one should be able to opt out from society. It suggests that the only possible way that a theory of social contract can work for society is if one can opt out and one can leave. This, of course, means that rather than responding to an alienation of members of society into individuals, I would argue that the alt-right is attempting to find a way to further that alienation by being able to create new communities that are separate from the whole. So it, arguing rather than returning to a totality that we should have continuous fracture and separate spaces. It also argues for hate speech and the promotion of hate speech and the undermining of electoral democracy. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that makes this movement different has been its effective use of online spaces. Trolling and shocking figures has been a common element on websites such as 4chan or Reddit in which violent imagery is used to trigger an emotional response in the audience in order to elicit uh, greater feedback. We also understand that this group adopts a South Park libertarian mentality of rejecting all elements of politics and suggesting that to engage in politics and to engage in any sort of activism or claims to truth is fundamentally ironic and a thing of satire. There is no correct view, so therefore the only correct view to have 
is one of complete tolerance and ignorance or complete hatred of everything. <laughs> and so that this becomes the issue with this politics is that it engages in works of anti-feminism because it says, rather than stressing that we live in an unequal society in which the only way to achieve equality is through a more equitable distribution of power and economic um, access, their response is to say the traditional, no, we should all be treated equal, therefore no one should be uh, given any special privilege. In 2014, there was a movement involving the video game community, an event called Gamergate. As with anything that is labeled gate, uh, it was a mockery of a political scandal, it was simply a woman who uh, posted a video game that received positive reviews online from jour journalists, uh, her ex, uh, I believe it was fiance, uh, said that the only reason why she received positive reviews was because she was sleeping around with various games journalists. This resulted in a massive section of hatred and violence against women. Um, and in fact, this is the moment where Steve, one of the moments where Steve Bannon realized the effect of harnessing trolls and uh, internet critics and members of that community <coughs> for hate speech because they can so effectively communicate anonymously and violently to shut down criticism. Additionally, the movement is incredibly pro-STEM and believes that there should be no equality within STEM fields for female participation and the participation of minorities. And clearly because most uh, social science literature and humanities literature has been taking up the claim of post-colonial politics, progressive politics to various extents, extent, and other progressive and critical approaches. They are also strongly against uh, non-quantitative social sciences or humanities, which is why one of the only exceptions would be economics departments, which may still have uh, extensive numbers of uh, the old right. Which brings me to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which are another thing that they wish to use and appropriate this idea is free um, capital, the capital that can be moved around easily and quickly without government surveillance. So some of the more obvious groups that we, I feel that many people are aware of are the capitalist funders, such as the Mercers, um, the Koch brothers to a lesser extent, though they did fund the libertarian movement. We know that most of the alt-right communication that receives public attention comes out of Breitbart, Fox, Infowars, and other um, accounts such as those. And one of the important things that it stresses, opposed to a libertarian value, is a dual structure um, for governance. One in which you have a bureaucratic market system and then the other is spectacle politics. You have figures making grand claims to make affective politics and in trying to create an aff affective image um, rather than an effective image. The politics is not about an efficient policy choice of the utilitarian policies of, of the neoliberal state, but rather one in which you build that wall because it is uh, what your base wants you claim that you're going to build a wall bigger when someone makes a critique. Because it doesn't matter if an event actually happens in the physical world, what matters is the event as spectacle occurring. And the moment that you make the tweet, that's when the event occurs. So this brings us to the second question, why is this a revolution? Well, look, when I look at it, I look at it as being led by a vanguard party. You had a strong intellectual base online that has been fairly well funded, that has been taking opportunity to expand rapidly. We understand that the group is not grassroots, per se, but rather led by a small group of people who have been actively supporting it, supporting other views. Like, it is still expanding and growing. There are contradictions in this ideology, like any ideology but it has been growing. The other important element is that it has been, in my opinion, significantly more effective 
at changing government policy than left-wing revolutionary politics within the West. I think it's a depressing thought, and that's, but if we want to look at who took down the TPP, it's the alt-right. Despite years of protests, I believe that the TPP was knocked out simply by um, Donald Trump's election and catering to the alt-right base. When we look at the fascists, we also see themselves as understanding themselves as revolutionaries. And this is something that figures, earlier figures on the far right have also argued themselves as, if you look at Mussolini and Hitler, both of them argued that they were leading revolutionary movements. So now I'm going to go into some of the concepts that I think the alt-right have co-opted and effectively used. One has been deterritorialization. Uh, this has been largely focused on their organization all structure, which is removed from a geographic base, and in fact has been largely used in the internet as a space, as the space for communication. Um, if you read the works of the alt-right thinker Nick Land, he strongly st stresses can, that accelerationism, which is the philosophy of accelerating capitalism to the point of singularity, is the philosophy of deterritorialization. And figures like Nick Land have heavily read the works of Deleuze and Guattari and focus on um, the very journals that critical theorists read as well. Next is an event like the invasion of Crimea, or what I would argue what's going on right now, the non-war against North Korea, which is used to rally popular support it's used to disrupt our traditional understandings of violence and conflict for both gains domestically, to gain domestic support, and also to make claims on, uh, on international territory without engaging in traditional uh, warfare. We have figures like Vladislav Zirkov, who strongly suggest the use of affective imagery or the denying of the affective image. We see the invasion of Ukraine at the initial stages involved uh, a combination of volunteers from nations like Serbia and also uh, Russian special forces dressed in, uh, dressed outside of uniform. So that way there was no image of Russian tanks rolling into Odessa until it was over. So this meant that we have a different type of politics that we're, engage that we're engaging in. It's focusing on a revolutionary military affairs and the changes in an affective form of politics in an affective war spectacle, which draws upon the works of figures like Baudrillard, who, they, who figures like Vladislav Zirkov, a Russian intellectual in the Kremlin, has explicitly referenced in the Duma. And finally, and two final points. One is a critique of democracy. We see that the alt-right has been using many of the same terms that uh, we have been using about critiques critiquing democracy, uh, the fact that it is not representation, all the fact that it is undermined by elites, uh, because it's definitely con is heavily influenced by the, uh, the media. But at the same time, it uses those techniques to create false equivalences, so that way when we engage in politics, and we start to use these terms, they're undermined. When a journalist or a uh, progressive academic reads a comment made by Donald Trump, we know that he's lying. And that's easy for us to say, but when these views are brought forward to the general public, they don't have years of critical theory training to understand what the nuance of this discussion is and elements of democracy. Because they're uninformed and unaware of these comments, they start to make false equivalencies. And this is brought into perhaps the most obvious, and I would argue the worst one, the identity politics versus identitarian politics, in which the alt-right has been using uh, the very language of identity politics to stress hate speech, arguing that we should focus on white identity and the preservation of white culture. It responds to movements such as Black Lives Matter by suggesting things like All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter to undermine that politics. It's about when you try to take the high road, they'll take the low road. When you take the low road, 
they'll take the high road. The, and the other thing is that many of these points and these ideas in identity politics are things that we teach in university and they're fairly straightforward to, under, to understand. And so many of, the people, many of the people who are critiquing these points use their knowledge of identity politics to critique it themselves. Additionally, we see figures like Emilio Giovanni, uh, Polis, uh, anyway, Milos, Milos, no. okay, Yiannopoulos, sorry, is a figure that is often used as an example for a, he's a uh, gay male who is used as a representation of uh, that, queer, that queer members of society may support the alt-right. He's dragged in front of the news on a regular basis. The same thing with uh, Steve Bannon's Angels, who are a group of pretty blonde women in their 20s that go on mainstream media to critique feminist politics. Now, if you understand the concept of intersectionality, obviously they're not representing everyone. But the point isn't to convince an intellectual in a factual debate that this is an identity politics. It's to make sure that some voter in the Midwest understand, doesn't understand the difference between identity politics and identitarian politics. And so on that note, I'm going to... Oh. So we have, uh, I believe, um, a little less than 15 minutes and we can have a discussion. Yes. Yeah, I, I think we're particularly lucky that after these two fantastic papers on, on passive revolution, because that's how I read Hong's uh, contribution as well, uh, we got uh, Andrew Jones here with the neo-fascist uh, revolution. Now, I, I came to the conference. It's, it's, uh, um, I came to the conference with the concept of counter-revolution in in my uh, in my head, um, and that was I that was what I was contracted for. And uh, when I hear these three presentations, I see two phases of the counter-revolution. Counter you know, in 1848, uh, to put it very briefly, the bourgeoisie switched from a progressive role to a conservative role. But it still remained the bourgeoisie in the sense that it, it was able to develop the, pro uh, the progressive forces. And when Gramsci speaks of passive revolution, he means uh, a, a, a process of developing the, uh, pr uh, the uh, productive forces under the leadership of the bourgeoisie, which neutralizes any uh, revolutionary, authentic revolutionary uh, move by the workers. So I would say uh, passive revolution is the benign stage of counter-revolution in which class compromise is still part of the project, but ultimately is, it, it is uh, counter-revolution, yet it depends, of course, on the ability of the bourgeoisie to continue to develop the productive forces and to bring all kinds of benefits to a broad strata of society. Now, as Andrew indicated, 2008 is the breaking point here, because after 2008, at the heart of capitalism, so in Anglo-America, basically, the ability to develop the productive forces in industry, for instance, is drying up for the simple reason that no investment is going into a productive industry anymore, and, and Google and Facebook, etc., have nothing to do with developing the productive forces. That's merely filling the space of what you call, rightly, spectacle uh, politics. So the neo-fascist uh, stage is not a revolution, but it's the phase of counter-revolution in which all semblance of class compromise is being dropped. And I, I think, apart from what you said about Russia, which I didn't understand properly, I think, <laughs> But uh, everything you said is, is a brilliant account of how this absolutely dangerous phase of counter-revolution, which, which will provoke events that we haven't seen for, for half a century, maybe, uh, is, is unfolding. So my question is really, do you realize that passive revolution, you presented it almost, I came in late, sorry, but you presented it almost as, as a benign stage, you know, in, in which, as if we have to think about how the passive revolution should proceed, whereas I think it's still based on the illusion that even in Mexico, uh, you can develop the productive forces and offer a class compromise to the large mass of the population. Whereas the Korean example, and ex also what happens in, in uh, Mexico, 
doesn't actually isn't actually able to fulfill that promise mm -hmm. because the real uh, image yeah. of the future is what Andrew mm -hmm. uh, told us. I'm afraid, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm really uh, impressed by what I heard. Yeah. Uh, uh, two quick questions for Andrew and and Hongsuk. Hongsuk. Um, Andrew, in your case, I just have a, two quick questions. Number one. What is the relationship between the opposition to globalization and deterritorialization in the ultra? And number two, what explains the fact that this particular group of capitalists, like the Koch brothers and Trump and so on, are with the alt right and they are against government bailout of the state? I mean, what section of the capitalist class do they belong to, and what is their positionality in relation to the dominant financial capitalist class of America? So, if you would reflect on that. And I mean, I really, uh, your presentation was very uh, good, Hongsuk, but I, and I, I don't, did not recall enough of my own understanding of the chronology of events in South Korea. So maybe this question is just a little bit, perhaps less coherent than I would like it to be. But I would like you to relate these events that you talk about now to what has happened since 1998 especially recalling that when the East Asian financial crisis took place, American capital was rubbing its hands, saying, oh, we are going to get Korean, very productive Korean companies at bargain basement prices, etc. So that's the first part of it. And, and so how was that resolved, and how did that relate to the sort of more the softer uh, attitude to labor and, and, and so on that you describe in the middle period, you know, where with um, the compromise, what was that thing you called it, the, um, uh, 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 some kind of corporate arrangement between yeah. capital and labor? Tripartite. 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 Yeah. So, so, so how did that relate to each other? And the second thing is, it's throughout all this time, what has been the discussion about capital controls in South Korea? Because obviously, it was when capital controls were lifted in South Korea in the 1990s as part of the condition to join the OECD, that's what gave rise to, that's what made South Korea the victim of the financial crisis. So what have they discussed about that? Mm -hmm. so, Anybody else? Uh, yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a, a kind of add on question that leads out of that, but it relates to the state institutions and the core institutions of the state, mainly the military and the police. You know, that's what Blue Lives Matter, if you didn't know, I mean, cops' lives matter. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, so it's primarily a question uh, directed toward. Um, but it relates to Daniel's presentation very intimately. Uh, because, it, and just to motivate it, in connection with the context that we're discussing this within, the context of this concept of uh, passive revolution, where I think the, the state institutions of violence always play a pivotal role. Because otherwise it's nonsense to talk about passive revolution as reproducing the state. So, but what I, what's missing from the presentation is the odd, especially in Korea, where the military factor is overwhelming. And here you have a peninsula that's surrounded by a, probably the most powerful deployment of the United States military, even, maybe even outside of the Middle East, with nuclear weapons. And, but in particular, maybe you could, address, you could connect your presentation to what's happening right now, currently, mm -hmm. with a situation which I think is, this is my opinion, you can contradict me, but is actually being pushed by the U.S. military, and so it's not just Trump's antics that's going on here, but it's Trump's antics in connection with a more aggressive posture by the U.S. military deployment in the Korean Peninsula, and particularly related to what I think was very interesting, the change in South Korea's attitude toward North Korea as a potential future semi-colony of some sort, okay? Is there, do you, do you see any way, do you have some way of relating this in the context of passive revolution ongoing today? And as it relates to the U.S. military, as it relates to Trump, and that's the, the Daniel part. It's actually this Andrew. 
and then we'll have these gentlemen respond. Could uh, is any, anyone else uh, want to question the panel? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, why don't you, gentlemen? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think that uh, uh, passive revolution can be seen as a culmination of a process of counter revolution. Uh, in the, the sense, the combination of what? The culmination of a process of counter revolution, in the sense that uh, to be uh, successful. The passive revolution must, uh, the, the ruling classes must um, include, incorporate uh, the uh, opposing, alien and even opposing aims and interests in, in, in their own uh, uh, historical project. Uh, so uh, to do that, and that implies technological change. I mean, ruling class to, to, uh, to make a successful uh, passive revolution uh, must in incorporate in their uh, historical project technological uh, change and even the, the aims of opposing alien and opposing uh, subaltern classes. But to see this relation, I think that we, we must uh, pass from, a, uh, from the paradigm of a permanent revolution to the paradigm of civil hegemony, which is the critique that, that Gramsci makes to, the, uh, to Trotsky's uh, thought. I mean, uh, when, he, uh, when Gramsci formulates his uh, uh, met methodological concept. He, he introduced it, it, them thinking in that uh, the, the way of domination of ruling classes has changed uh, since the, the 1848 revolution, uh, revolutionary movement. Uh, from, uh, and that change in, uh, included the the hegemony the the, the, the a, a, tried, a a cultural hegemony so he says for the subaltern uh, classes and groups to make a revolution we we have to to be uh, first uh, a uh, become first a, um, a a ruling class and and a and then a dominant and then afterward a dominant class and to to become a ruling class we have to be uh, a gem, a, a hegemonic in, in a cultural way not only in a political but in a cultural way so I think that uh, having in mind this uh, structure of uh, between permanent revolution and civil hegemony, we can conceive passive revolution as a culmination of a, of a counter revolution. Uh, and that, that in that sense that I uh, present, uh, presented Mexican revolution as a passive revolution. Uh, and that in that sense too, I, I'm thinking in a pro progressive outcome, outcome of uh, neoliberalism cri uh, crisis uh, incorpor uh, incorporating a, 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 a social and passive revolution process. Um, well, I well I I, uh, I have some observations. For, no, uh, well, we for we need to because it's uh, now the lunch hour. We have to allow the other discussions. Yeah. Okay. But I have some observations to the other presentation that I would like to make. Uh, well, I guess uh, it's a question of... Uh, it's very uh, quick. Uh, One minute. Do it. <laughs> One well, minute. Because the One discussion minute. is you not just only... Just do it. Some, well, just just do it. Okay. Okay. One minute. Okay. Okay. Well, um, for, uh, for Korea, I want to, uh, uh, to ask you uh, if Korea has uh, returned or has... In, uh, has uh, 
take a uh, neoliberal pa uh, path of yes, yes. Uh, my question is what happened with the developmental state mm -hmm. what uh, what happened with the developmental state in the case of Korea if assuming that Korea is mm -hmm. is uh, uh, is uh, um, following a uh, neoliberal path. Yeah, you, you mean from the crisis or the, from the introduction of neoliberalism and then so far? See, well, yes, what, what happened with the, the, the developmental state? Okay, and could you uh, uh, now speak about your uh, few thoughts, because we're pressed for time, and, can they speak and about concerning what, what can you say? Uh, I would say that uh, well, about the uh, the causes, I think that one cause uh, of the emergence of the old type, uh, particularly in the, in the United States, is the relocation of capital, because uh, the strong electoral uh, force of uh, Trump was in the relocalized uh, capital regions. And, and then there was a, a process of deterioration there. So I think that, that that's one important cause of... Uh, okay, I, I think we, we need now to have the uh, other two discussants say something now. <laughs> no, no, you have to stop speaking. You must stop speaking. The other discussants have... <laughs> I, I, I was the, the one who spoke no. less in the presentation. You can speak to these gentlemen after uh, You can talk to them much. afterwards. That's why we have all these other social occasions as well. Yeah. Only, only an observation. I, said, only I think you're wasting I'm everyone's sorry. time, Sergio, please. Okay, okay. My yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, you asked me about the military factor yeah. or overwhelming uh, in the current situation but nobody no everybody knew no has known has known about North Korea it developed it it has developed you know nuclear bomb so long time but suddenly today it became harbor why I want to ask why you know this timing you know, this timing of, you know, became problematic of a nuclear bomb, was developed a nuclear bomb by North Korea. I guess it shows a secret, no, not secret, you know, open secret of a U.S. imperialism, you know, ruling over the world. Afghanistan, and then where? Of course, it's impossible. I'm convinced that it's impossible taking place any kind of world in South Korea, in Korean Peninsula. Because it's too dangerous for capitalism. No war. No war, no war. There are, you know, Russia, China, Korea, of course, but Japan. It's collapsed. If there was war, it is more than, you know, World War, World War II. You know, it's impossible. It's impossible for both North Korea and the U.S. They knew. They know. Could just you me. add just one more point, and then we'll move to the, the last person, please? Because we have to end the session. <laughs> I will. I will uh, fast. Fast. And well, so we have lunch. The time. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you, just one. So I don't think this this kind of like a movement, uh, revolution, is in the passive movement, but it could be a first step to make a passive revolution in the future. And thank you, Radhika. Your questions, it yeah, that um, that you know support my presentation. First one, uh, buying <laughs> Korean companies by yes yes it was done, I know. But no, already took place. Already the crisis took place. What else remained? You know, they they used they used a neoliberal neoliberal system you know, for their own their own famous products, you know. So before the time, you know, before and after, it's different, you know, from by the devil to, to the, you know, policy of death. But I will, I will say another things. And second, uh, communist, 
uh, the commission, the commission, uh, what roles it had, did it ask? Um, it's simple, it's simple. Uh, as I said, capitalists don't, you know, they, they don't care about you know, illegal or legal. You know, just to choose in, you know, according to the situation. That time, they wanted to make legalized debt. So the role, the, the, the builder, the builder of a commission, he wrote that. It's just for Kane workers' movement. That's all. He wrote that in an article, an official article. And so, the last, last, last question, OECD. Yes, actually, neoliberal system was introduced in 1993, not at the crisis. But I believe 1997 crisis was an uh, overproduction crisis, but it took a form of financial crisis. Because, as you said, at, from, from you know, the, you know, the, the membership of OECD and opening the financial market into, into, into the world finance market, then makes that then makes then makes a shift of form of crisis from you know direct over over productive crisis to financial <coughs> crisis. So I believe so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll make it very quick. So. First of all, the financiers of the alt-right, and in any of the countries, are nationalists first. David Koch ran for president of the United States in 1980. Uh, someone like Steve Bannon served in the military for, and the Navy for about a decade. These people are passionate American patriots, and that's why they're supporting alt-right capital rather than transnational capital, in my opinion. I think that's one of the elements. The other thing to say, connected to the past revolution, the discon discommunity, is the fact that the Koch brothers and other groups were funding intellectuals in the libertarian movement for about 30 years before that turned into a prominent force deciding uh, American politics, and then it paid off. And the politics now, after Citizens United, is a politics of paying politicians to say what you want. So that means that there is a new stage, and that's the discontinuity that I see between those two movements. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking in 1.30, and I promise you that when the chair says, stop, I'm <laughs> <laughs>